Well, well, thanks for everybody for coming. Uh, I think I know almost everybody here, but just in case I want to introduce myself, I'm Bill Stanley, I'm the director of the Latin American and Hungarian Institute. Uh, uh, before we get started, I want to thank Robin and, and Krista for setting up everything and uh, making arrangements for this. Uh, good things sometimes have to come to an end, and that's the case from the Latin American database. Um, as, as you all know, the LAII has, has ended publication, new publication of the Latin American database newsletters after three decades uh, of, of journalism and information services about Latin America. Um, and we're in the process of transferring that archive of, of uh, tens of thousands of stories uh, to permanent storage in the library. Um, so today we're going to be hearing uh, from LADB editor uh, uh, Carlos Navarro um, uh, about various aspects of, of uh, LADB's coverage, kind of looking back retrospectively at the major trends, major changes that have taken place uh, uh, in our coverage. Um, uh, we'll, we'll, hear, we'll hear some words from LADB founder, Professor Nelson Valdez, uh, from Rebecca Hemphill, who will be here uh, shortly, uh, from Vicki Nelson, both of whom oversaw management of LADB uh, for years, uh, as well as Patricia Hines, uh, Kevin Robinson, and Deborah Tyrell, they're all of whom wrote and edited uh, for LADB. They'll be adding some words as well. Uh, before I introduce Carlos, uh, I, I want to just reflect on a couple of in a couple ways on, on what LADB meant to me as a, as a, as a researcher and a, as a teacher. Um, I work mainly on civil wars in Central America. Uh, I do a lot of work on military politics and on peace processes, uh, police reform, judicial reform processes, struggles to end impunity in Central America, elections and electoral reform, the erosion of democracy in Nicaragua in recent years, uh, etc. And I taught on Central America and on Latin American politics uh, generally. And I found LABB just an essential tool uh, in, in my work over, over the last years. And it's one thing to read the newspapers, uh, follow events as they're unfolding, kind of generally have an idea of what's going on in countries. It's another to find yourself in front of a classroom trying to present a coherent narrative <laughs> about how uh, events unfolded on a particular issue or around a particular event, you know, take the the, the coup in 1993 in, in, in Guatemala. Uh, what exactly happened? Who did what? What did it mean? How do we understand its impact? Those kinds of questions were ones that I often found myself lecturing on and also writing on in, in, in book chapters and articles I attempted to write about police reform processes, etc. And I found over and over again that LADB was a vital resource because of its searchability and because of the in-depth nature of the stories. Uh, the the, the you know, more than sort of daily news depth uh, was, uh, was critical. And so if I was trying to understand and reassemble in a coherent narrative about what, what happened in, in a particular place and time, LADB was, was you know, the best resource for, for doing that because of the type of reporting and because of the searchability and because of the ability to go back from one story to the, the previous stories that were linked to it. Um, so I just wanted to say, I mean, it, it, it was and will continue to be a vital uh, a resource for, for researchers on the region um, as well as, as the teachers. So that's just kind of my two cents um, to me personally the importance of LADB uh, over the years. And I want to introduce Carlos Navarro. Um, uh, Carlos grew up in Mexico City. I'm going to embarrass you a little bit here, sorry. <laughs> uh, grew up in Mexico City, uh, then received his Bachelor in Arts in Communication and Journalism from Loyola University in New Orleans, and a Master of Business Administration in International Trade from Texas A&M International in Laredo. He began his journalism career as a staff writer for the Laredo Times, and as a writer-editor for Knight Ritter Financial News. Um, he did freelance articles for the Journal of Commerce, Port Record for the Port of New Orleans, and Industria Avicola for Watt Global Media. He began working as technical editor at the Latin America Database in 1992, where his primary responsibility initially was as a technical writer for SourceMex, which was the newsletter we produced on, on Mexico uh, for LADB. And then over the past several years, he assumed wider responsibilities, becoming manager ed managing editor of LADB, where he oversaw the production of, of three newsletters, uh, SourceMex, Noticen, and Notisur, covering Mexico, Central America, and the, and the, uh, Central America and the Caribbean, and South America, respectively. Uh, he regularly represented UNM and LAII at the U.S. Board of Governors conferences and conferences for journalists and editors covering Latin America. 
Beyond his work at LAII, Carlos plays a leadership role in two advocacy and education uh, anti-hunger organizations. Uh, he serves on the board of directors of Bread for the World and helped create the Interfaith Hunger Coalition in Albuquerque. And he's been, for this work, he's received a number of awards. Uh, he's, he's a hunger hero from Bread for the World. Uh, uh, he won the Chris and John Halland Advocacy Award from the Lutheran Advocacy Ministry of New Mexico. Uh, and the Lumen Ecclesiae, I'm sure I mispronounced that award from the Dominican Ecclesial Institute uh, in 2017. Um, so, Carlos, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to thank everyone for being here. Um, uh, Bill already mentioned some of the. I, I started, I've been associated with with LABD since 1992. So that spans most of the most of the history of the organization. Uh, um, the LA, LABD started in 1986, and, and Nelson Valdez will tell you more about that. Um, and as Bill mentioned, several of the people who helped create this project. It's a su successful project I hear this afternoon, and unfortunately others who, who thought they might be coming had last minute emergencies that couldn't come. Um, so um, we, we actually stopped publishing, LADB stopped publishing exactly a year ago at the end of April of 2018, but we never gave the, the project a proper farewell, so this acts as a proper farewell for LADB. Um, our, our coverage of Latin America only spanned three decades, but there are many significant developments that occurred during this period. <coughs> You'll hear about some of those developments a little later. For most of our existence, our, our name was Latin America Database. Um, back in, I think, 2017, we decided that maybe a, a, a way to get more subscribers is to change our name to make it all catchy. And, and we changed it to Latin America Digital Elite. <coughs> and that name came from um, Suzanne Shadel, who was a Latin American collections curator. Um, she left recently, you, did I left you on have to take a position with the Library of Congress. But Suzanne was always a very good resource for us at the university libraries. Um, you, you'll hear from me later, but uh, for now, I, I'd like to turn the floor over to, to Nelson Valdez, who will give us a little bit of the history <coughs> of, of LADB. Nelson, it's yours. <coughs> very happy to be here. I'm thankful for the invitation. This is a very historical room. Many important decisions related to Latin American studies were made here. People that we tried to uh, recruit from outside UNM had to come over here and lecture. And I want to tell you uh, three main themes, and I, I'll be short, I swear. <coughs> um, the first thing is that there is a, there is a political history <coughs> to the LADB and the Latin American Museum. And that is, when the Sandinistas came to power in 79, and then Ronald Reagan in 1980, obviously there was going to be a confrontation <laughs> in, in Latin America as a result. And one of the things that occurred is that there is one university that historically has been much more connected to the Republican Party than any other dealing with Latin America. And that's at the private University of Miami. So the Cubanos in Miami thought that the victory of the Sandinistas and the guerrilla movement in Central America was a perfect moment to request monies from the US government. But there was a problem. They are a private university. So I want to bring to your attention something that I think most people don't realize. And that is that 
someone at the University of Miami leaked, I know who did it, leaked the information to us here that there was a movida to get the University of Miami to get funding to deal with Latin America because of the threat of communism. And the way they were going, they were going to do it was by proposing that funding should go to uh, centers that look at the North and the South, not regional studies. North-South centers, only two. Hawaii and Miami. That was leaked to us, and at the time then, you had Merckx, Lewin, Martin Niedler, Marshall Mason, and others who then say, what do we do and what not? And there were discussions about this. And that's when they thought, oh, we need to stress more than ever, all that was done in the past, that it should be area centers that should be funded. So we then contacted UCLA, University of Arizona, uh, Pittsburgh, etc., etc., so that their congressional delegation will put forward changing north-south to regional area study centers. So that's how money began to flow <laughs> later on. That's a, just a little story <clears throat> to tell you. And the the other thing that I want to mention is that we were very, we are very lucky to have Los Alamos labs, not only because they build a better bomb every year, <laughs> but but moreover, they are built in a place that is, if you look at the geography, the location, in a place that the only way that they can expand is by getting rid of all equipment. Mm. All is the year before. Oh. <laughs> and at the time, I met a fellow, most unusual person, Ed Grothus, who <laughs> stole, who, who sold, I should say, <laughs> stole as well, because he was buying for pennies, since they were very expensive. Mm. So we began to buy radio teletype machines because we had a graduate student getting an MA at the University of New Mexico by the name of Bob Rungeon who had been in special forces in Colombia and Panama and he was in radio communications he got a master's degree from the University of New Mexico and he helped us figure out how to capture radio teletype signals sent by shortwave zeros and ones and to convert them into letters. <laughs> In other words, there is a very interesting institutional history and there is a very personal element connected to this that I think indeed needs to be uh, written about. Uh, the, the Handbook of Latin American Studies, um, I think it was in the 1997-1998 issue, had a very long piece on the LADB that if we want to sing praises to ourselves, uh, we should find it. I can provide it to you uh, afterwards. Uh, but the, 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 the LADB survive, among other things, before it could get funding, because there were a lot of people who actually were giving us money. Uh, Marshall Nason did, for example. Uh, but there were others who uh, were also doing so, including a biologist from the University of New Mexico, who had an assumed name who, in fact, was part of the team that had to figure out the structure of DNA in the race between the American team and the French team. And this fellow's name is now dead. It was Malcolm Wofsky. He was known at the University of New Mexico as a leading biologist by the name of Malcolm Gordon. 
Gordong, Malcolm Gordon gave us thousands because he was a red diaper baby <laughs> who thought that the LADV will move to the left. And uh, so Malcolm helped, uh, IBM helped. IBM used to have, when you had those big machines and so forth, so we would go and knock on the door on December. I said, are you coming with a new machine? What are you doing with the old ones? <laughs> Radio teletype machines. Uh, those who work at the Latin American Institute probably remember the noise. Like, taka, 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 taka. <laughs> and it was the stuff that the State Department sent as the American Republic Files, ARF. And we used to capture it. It didn't code it. <laughs> Plain text. As time went. So there's a lot of that. One thing, the computing people, the computer department, also contributed a lot. You might say, you're forgetting the Latin Americanists. But you know about the Latin Americanists. But there is this other story. <coughs> we had a wonderful graduate student in working with Ramiro Jordan. And what he was working was in figuring out the algorithms that you could then capture the stuff that was send, sent uh, over radio teletype as well. Uh, and Renzo figured this one out and he gave his search engine a very interesting name. He called it Recluse. And some of you may, who work at the LEDB, may remember Recluse. Yeah. He left us because Microsoft offered a better job. <laughs> so there is a lot of stuff here uh, in terms of some of, you know, Bill Robinson. Barbara Cole wrote very fast and in a very elegant manner and very insightful as well. Uh, of course, we also had all kinds of different support uh, coming from the university at different levels uh, who we're not always sure of what we were doing, but it was, uh, we were supported. Uh, research and grants uh, work with uh, us in getting monies and so forth. And there's much, much, much more that I could uh, talk about and perhaps we should write all of this. Uh, I would suggest that if you look at the handbook of Latin American studies, <coughs> Uh, uh, from the Library of Congress. It has the best uh, summary of the, that history and what we contributed up to that point and thereafter. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you, Nelson. Um, now we're going to look at some of the... We're bringing from where Nelson, the history that Nelson gave, gave us to a little bit of how it, the LEB evolved in a contemporary manner. LEDB is first and foremost a resource for educators, scholars, and students. Many of our subscribers through the years were universities with Latin American Studies <coughs> programs, and several people were instrumental in recruiting and maintaining our subscriber base, including Roma Arellano, who couldn't be here, here. Rebecca Hamill, and Vicky really Nelson. Here. Vicky will now, will now say a brief word about our subscribers and will tell us how our parallel education services for primary and secondary schools was created. Um, well, I don't have as interesting a presentation as Nelson did. <laughs> but I will tell you that um, in the early days of LEDB, I was not as involved in the management side. We have Rebecca. Um, Downstair then, but in the more recent years, I did work with with building our subscriber base. As Carlos notes here, it was actually quite diverse. 
And so we had organizations um, council uh, of formulations, the um, Library of Congress, the United Nations, were all subscribers to LADD. Uh, we also had um, not-for-profits that subscribed. We had an interesting organization called Coffee for Kids. And um, we had Mary Knoll as subscribers. Um, we also had um, news services. Newsweek was a subscriber to LADB. Mm -hmm. Media outlets, uh, we had news services. LexisNexis, ProQuest, The Gale Group, those kinds of. Um, but by far and large, the, um, the majority of our subscribers were university libraries. And this was very fortunate because um, as universities would funnel their subscriptions to LADB through their libraries, they were then able to make that open to all of the faculty, staff, and students on their campuses. So it, you know, really helped with our readership and with the exposure that LADB got. And I think at peak we probably had, you know, more than 50 uh, university libraries subscribing. Many of them were our peers, other Latin American <coughs> service centers throughout the country and internationally as well. Um, and I think one of the biggest coup was when uh, the University of California systems, I think 10 of their 12 campuses subscribed to LADB. So I, I think it's, it's quite um, um, a, a, an accomplishment to see the various um, entities that subscribe to the LADB. And then one of the things I think that we're most proud of is that we were able to offer this, the service to K through really 16 educators. So we had teachers from across, across the country who were able to access LADB, and these were of course weekly newsletters, three of them, that they were getting in their inboxes that they were able to read and share with their classes. And these were teachers who were teaching history, um, economics, language, culture, you know, across the spectrum. And one of the things that um, actually helped us in making LADB uh, known to teachers was a ReadyNet project. Uh, it was a grant that we received from the Department of Education. And um, the primary purpose of that grant was to prepare curriculum resources for teachers. And this was groundbreaking as well. As a National Resource Center, um, one of the focuses of of the, of the NRC was to help teachers teach about Latin America. And so the LADB resources that were generated as part of this ReadyNet grant um, were widely used across the country as well. And so um, they were lesson plans that would take a special uh, topic or research focus that would include articles on that topic and then questions for discussion and so it was almost like a, just a, a total packaged lesson plan that teachers could use. And I think by far that was probably one of the most useful and most appreciated um, parts of what LADB was doing and who they were, we were reaching out to. So that's what I have in terms of subscribers and our education project. Thank you. Thank you. Like a lot of our in our publicity, we like to we'd like to talk about how many articles we had in our archive. Twenty eight thousand articles published in English, and one of the, the biggest advantages that we had at LADB is the searchability. But our our search engine didn't come easy, and so Rebecca Hempel will tell us a little bit about how the search engine came about. That projection makes Iceland look huge. That's <laughs> really. Yeah. 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 That's part of it. Okay. So Nelson, uh, I'm looking to see if we have any of the amazing graduate students um, that helped. We, uh, one of the resources for teaching about the Americas I wanted to mention, I wanted to give some credit to, to people that uh, came and went but made all the difference in the world. And uh, a lot of <coughs> graduate students upgraded. I came in and resources for the teaching about the Americas was uh, had been gotten for, uh, funded through a Department of Education grant and uh, that was under my predecessor Roma Ariana who was the program 
manager there. And she, uh, but then later, as we got the search engine and as more teachers were using the web, um, um, the they needed to be updated. They didn't have links. You know, teachers now are expecting links to other resources. So we had some graduate students come and put in links to images and related topics and, and also added some more updated um, lesson plans. That was actually a really popular item. So Nelson mentioned recluse. They're grabbing the news from the sky. It's tacking, tacking in that little, in the little miserable um, building that we had, in which uh, the ceiling fell in on Carlos several times. I was going to thank Chris Lopez, uh, Christine Lopez, for getting that eventually, you know, uh, fixed. The swamp cooler would leak. It was a, it was a, you know, it was real news, newsroom kind of glamour. And I didn't, I wasn't there then, but they had. Um, I came shortly after it had been turned into a search engine that you could get, dial in by modem. And then, you know, the World Wide Web, Al Gore was right, it really was going to make a difference. And we ended up having the very first sort of this little rickety website with very primitive drawing on it. And we were hoping that, um, gosh, was it, it was Yahoo, that the Yahoo search engine would somehow find us. And, um, you know, meanwhile, the libraries were very used to, the university libraries were used to modem dialing in, and they, you know, that didn't bother them. But in 1996, which is when I started, it was really important to get something usable as the web took off. Of course, we had, you know, talk about all those subscribers, but they paid very, very little for this. <laughs> they did not pay for the salaries of Pat, Kevin, Mike, all the writers. And my job, I was hired uh, by Gil Merckx, uh, and Vicki sat in on the interview, and they were gave me one year uh, to see if we could raise enough money and get this thing going more modern on the web. And they couldn't promise me employment beyond that one year. So we needed a systems administrator, somebody who could work on, we had a little PC that was functioning as the server. As the server. And he had to take this recluse, named after the brown recluse spider that can go down in there, and turn it into something that could be searchable. But we couldn't pay for anything that was a search engine. We couldn't pay for a Microsoft, anything. And so we hired a fellow named Sam Jones, tall, lanky, unusual guy whose brother was a professional bluegrass musician, and <laughs> just let him loose. And um, I think the proudest description of any professional um, work I've ever done in my life was when Sam said that I was a good geek herd, meaning like a shepherd, but you can shepherd geeks. Um, I let him go and loose, and he was all about open source. And he found through Linux something called MySQL, which is that now has been blossomed and used by all these major organizations, and probably is living. You know, the bowels of Facebook and, and Google probably include some of this early search engine stuff. And he built one from scratch in that miserable little room. And then um, he moved on to better things, and then Nathan Walworth came, and he built some more, and he was rabid open source guy. People thought that there shouldn't be charging, you shouldn't have to charge for anything, you'd make your code available to everybody, and they did really actually noble work. And that it made this actually possible to even try to sell and have people access it. Teachers would never have been able to get any of this stuff if it weren't for uh, Sam, Nathan, and then Nathan's subsequent partner, um, Lamaya Kramer, and then from then on. And I just wanted to mention them. Um, it was a hard sell as the web took off. Everybody thought they could get everything for free, and we were struggling with the same thing as Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and everybody else as they went on. You know, she'll be charged by the article. Do we have to give it away for free? And they're still fighting about that. I was here 11 and a half years. And um, every day, how many of you have seen the movie The Princess Bride? Well, the, the hero, the noble hero, is a guy named Wesley. And in his youth, he's kidnapped by the dread pirate Roberts. And he's kept on the ship, on the, on the dread pirate Roberts ship, you know, for, for years, um, learning to trade, and he's, a, he's just a slave on the ship. And every night, the dread pilot Roberts would say to him, Good night, Wesley. Good work. Sleep well. 
I'll most likely kill you in the morning. <laughs> That's how it felt working here for 11 and a half years. We, they did good work. We were all told good work. The library said we like you, and we were never making our budget, and, um, and there was always some new terrible stressor on the technology side that nobody wanted to hear about or care about. And it was very much like that. Good night, LADP. Good work. Sleep well. We'll most likely kill you in the morning. And here we are all these years later. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now we come to the exciting part where we'll talk a little bit about the newsletters, but before we talk about the newsletters, I, I want to um, mention, uh, well, there's three newsletters, as, uh, as, as Bill mentioned earlier, the newsletter on Central America and the Caribbean, Notisen, um, South America was Notisur, and Source Nexus, which I wrote most of the years, almost, almost every article on Source Mix in our database, I wrote except a few freelance pieces that other folks wrote. So I, I, I became known as a Mexico expert because I wrote all those articles on Mexico, but I don't necessarily know everything that needed to, you needed to know about Mexico. Carlos, briefly, there was Cuba source. There it is, okay. Yeah, no, this is what I, um, those three newsletters um, are the ones that are the face of LADB, but we had a lot of other newsletters. Mm -hmm. The Central America update was Politics in Central America, um, and um, not the same. You used to, I think started out as an economic newsletter, and so eventually Central America update and Cuba source were were folded into um, not the same. and so was Eco Central. We got a grant to write about um, environmental developments in Central America, and so we had Eco Central for a, maybe a couple years, maybe three years. The Chronicle of Latin American Affairs was the economic newsletter on South America and the region in Notisur was the political newsletter and so they were folded into um, each other and then Notien was another grant funded newsletter that we had and that was specifically focusing on energy in the Americas. Um, and why we, that, that newsletter is already in the University Libraries Archive. Um, and of course, I one of the things that we started to promote LADB with the help of three grad students, we did a blog, the LADB blog. And we could do a lot more with a blog than, than our regular newsletters. We could include pictures and stuff. And so our grad students had a lot of fun writing them. Uh, Joe Lisma, um, uh, Jake Sandler, and Sabrina Hernandez were our bloggers, uh, including uh, in addition to myself. These were people who are, and this, uh, you recognize some of the various people who are actually writers, unstaffed writers for LADB, and um, some of them are in this room, um, and some of them I don't know. John Nagel <laughs> came before me, and um, I believe Deborah is here, and I, this is the first time I've ever met Deborah. Um, Eliana Rosa and Pat were copy editors at the end of the. Of the um, and the, they did the copy editing remotely. Um, we relied on freelance contribu contri contributors, and the ones at the bottom were people who could, there were many more than those, but they were the ones who, who contributed articles while, um, while we had the on staff to supplement our on staff writing. In the later years, um, as our full-time staff began dwindling, and I was the only full-time person. We relied on um, people in the region to write freelance articles for us, and that's the <coughs> group. Some of them, Johanna Mar Maris was in, in, in Europe. Um, the one person that I liked, that I enjoyed meeting the most, and I actually met him in person, was Benjamin ben Witte Libar, and he, he was uh, in Chile um, uh, when, when he started writing for us. In Santiago, but he'd married a French woman, and so he eventually moved to Paris, and and, and then Montpellier, and they started, he started writing our, a couple of on Central, a couple of Central American countries on Chile from Paris, from France. So so it was it, this was a this is a time when when it became possible to 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 do everything remotely. Mm -hmm. 
And um, I didn't want to leave out the folks who did other, <coughs> other work. And uh, Rebecca mentioned Sam Jones, and so those are, um, I'm sure I left out some names uh, out of that. Okay, now the news coverage. This is what you've all been waiting for. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to start with a little bit of trivia. Yeah, you'll, you'll enjoy this, I'm pretty sure. Okay, Jorge Bergoglio. We, we covered Jorge Bergoglio when he was a, was a cardinal oh, in uh, Buenos Aires. It's yeah. Pope Francis now. James yes. Comey. No he way. Not, he was quoted in our newsletter. <laughs> the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. Kamala Harris. Oh. We had a we had a reference to her. This is this was a an article on child trafficking, and she was uh, um, the district attorney in San Francisco, and she teamed up with with an assembly woman to do uh, um, a piece, uh, an article in the San Francisco Chronicle that recorded her. Alfonso Cuaron, how many of you know Alfonso Cuaron? <laughs> Roma and gravity, yeah. and, and actually he he was he was, he was involved very politically, and so he he, he got he uh, took issue with uh, the way that President Peña Nieto was private, um, uh, privatizing some of the energy sector in, in Mexico. So he wrote this piece. <laughs> Mike, Mike Pence is a representative. Mike Pence and he got involved in some. <coughs> Immigration debate. Everybody's surprised. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and um, entertainers and athletes in politics. Ruben Blades. Oh, uh, the grand for president of Panama. Cuauhtémoc Blanco was a Mexican soccer star. He's uh, the, gov the governor of the state of Morelos right now. He won his last election. Michael Martelli. A music star known for his lyrics and State antics, he's elected president of Haiti. He, he, someone else has been elected since, but he was. Jimmy Morales, he's still president of Guatemala. He was a comic actor who started in a slapstick comedy as a cowboy. He's still applying. <laughs> <laughs> a comic won an election just the other day. Yes. In, in, yeah, in, in, uh, yeah. And we had a priest uh, sent to the, to the presidency. Jean Bertrand Aristide in, in Haiti. Fernando Lugo was a bishop and he ended up being president of, of Paraguay before he was deposed. <laughs> Former journalists who were elected to office, Andres Pastrana in, in uh, Colombia, and Mauricio Funes, a TV journalist, was elected president of El Salvador. Okay, now we now now be enough with the trivia and we'll look at some of the issues. <laughs> Gender equity or inequity. This is our coverage in source mix about this was important in two thousand eight because that, that really changed the um, the makeup of the Congress in Mexico. And in and, and, and in twenty fourteen Chile's constitution encouraged greater female representation in Congress. Um, but there was also pushback, there were conservative sectors in Peru promoting a campaign against gender education. And then in 2018, the, all the gains that were made kind of started retreating. And so our, we wrote that in Opisuda in 2018. Um, despite the inconsistent track of record on female participation in political life, six women have been elected president in the region. And here we go. Um, I want to tell you that we didn't care. we didn't have any pictures in our newsletters, but I went on Wikimedia Commons and got some pictures to illustrate. <laughs> Michelle Bachelet in Chile was elected two different times. Laura Chinchilla was elected president of, of Costa Rica. Violeta Chamorro was president of Nicaragua. Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner was president twice in Argentina. Mireya Moscoso was elected president of Panama. So three of those female presidents were from Central America, the small countries in Central America. Um, Chilma Rousseff was president of Brazil. And in Mexico, the, the Secretario de Gobernación Interior Secretary is considered second in command because there's no vice president. And Mexico had never had a, a Secretaria, Interior Secretary until this, um, President Lopez Obrador got elected, 
and his interior secretary is a former Supreme Court Justice by the name of Olga Sanchez Cordero. Okay, um, Jennifer, did you want to say anything about gender equity? You did some research on gender equity? Oh, I was, well, when I was, I was um, a writer in the early days, and from 90 to 92, and at that time, I was looking a lot, I was writing for um, Central America Update, and I tried to find articles about women. There wasn't a lot coming through, so there wasn't a lot, but there were a few times when we um, were able to write some in depth <coughs> articles based on interviews with people that were coming through um, the university, or actually interviewed um, Selena Espinosa, who worked with um, Mexican women who come across the border to have an abortion in a little place in San Diego, so there was an interview with her in the database somewhere. And um, I don't know, I just looked for ways to try to bring that in, because it wasn't typically in the news, it was not really typically in what we were seeing. Quite a contrast to what we eventually covered in. Right. Well, I just think it has to do with how much was in the news as well. Yeah, but, but, yeah. but thanks. Um, if there's two issues that we covered that that um, coincide with the lifespan of LADB, the one is the Colombia peace process, and the other one was the Cuban embargo that was still in place. Um, but uh, the, the Colombia peace process was. Um, I decided to, to focus on this as one of the issues to, to define LADB. And as a, of course you know the conflict precedes LADB and yeah, back in 82 and in the 80s. Um, in 1980, um, the, uh, the, that's when the um, negotiations were starting. And I, I put the, the, the pictures of the presidents. We <coughs> covered a lot of this in, in our in, in LADB. Um, I also put the pictures of the guerrillas, the guerrilla leaders. This is uh, Juan Manuel Santos, and, and the, the guerrilla leaders. His name is. He went by the nickname of Timochenko in in twenty in in the. In the 2010s is when the, the, the peace process finally um, was uh, resolved. Um, but all, all these years, there was a lot of back and forth uh, with the guerrillas and the, the Colombian um, administration. So, um, Pat Hines will tell us a little bit of what she found during her coverage years. I also think this peace process spanned my whole lifetime. <laughs> I also can't remember my own name anymore without notes. Um, the Colombian Peace Accords ended a 52-year conflict, and it was signed in November 1916 between the FARC and the Santos government in Colombia. And they had had two years of secret negotiations plus four years of public negotiations in Havana. Following the signing of the peace process, they brought it to a referendum to the people of Colombia, and lo and behold, they voted against it. You know, who votes against peace? Well, the prior president, Alvaro Uribe, had really fought against the peace process and saw that the referendum went down. Later, the Colombian Congress tweaked it a little bit, and they passed it. Um, the, the conflict left 220,000 dead, 25,000 disappeared, and 5.7 million people displaced. Now, President Duque was elected in 2018, and he campaigned against the peace process. And of course, he was backed by Uribe. And since he was elected, in, by the end of 2018, it's very shaky at this point how much of a peace process there really is. One interesting thing for us here in the United States, President Obama, signed aid, signed a bill to give aid to Colombia to further the peace process. When President Trump came in, why would we be surprised? He cut that aid. And his conditions on all aid going to Colombia at this point are that none of the aid can go toward the peace process. It can only go to coca eradication and aerial spray. 
So probably Colombia is on its way to kind of, you know, like so many other places in Latin America right now, sliding backwards. Because they've got all those Venezuelan refugees right now. Oh, yeah. So that was some of the highlights of the <clears throat> what we covered in the in the Columbia peace process. Thank you, Pat. I took this picture in Cuba when I was in Havana, um, and so well, some of these pictures are the ones that I took. But um, I, I won't dwell a lot on Cuba. Um, but it, it, the reason I, I put the slide in is because. That embargo that was put in place is still in place, even though there was a, even though there was an opening. Um, there were efforts to, to end the embargo, um, but it, it never really, never never really happened because there's there's a strong lobby in in Florida that is very politically powerful that keeps it from happening. Um, uh, but there there was a there was a, a change during the during the Obama years and during the Raúl Castro years and in. In, 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 in Cuba is that there was an economic opening and uh, um, the, a lot of people were allowed to have businesses um, and, and many of us who traveled to Cuba during that time um, would experience some of those businesses and a lot of them were, the restaurants are fabulous, they're called paladares and there's a lot of, a lot of hostels, bed and breakfast type of places but I think the one thing that that we were told is that while well, that brought uh, um, enhanced the tourism of Cuba and it, it, and it there was a tension between the philosophy of Raul Castro and what Fidel Castro um, why Fidel Castro opposed that kind of those kind of businesses because it would create a, a, a system of class and so there was a middle class that was go, going um, growing in Cuba and, and not so much um, and, and there's people who weren't benefiting from that. Um, in fact, on, on when during a trip that I went to, we flew from Cancun, and there was a we flew on Cubana de Aviación, Cubana Airlines, to, to Havana from Cancun, and there's a long line, a special line with people with flat screen TVs and air conditioners. Uh, they're bringing them back. They were allowed a certain allotment to bring back consumer goods, and those are the the, the middle class that that emerged with the opening, the economic opening. So it's a great story. So. The Central America peace process, there were three agreements that we covered and um, very important. Uh, there, was a, there was a long war between uh, in Guatemala and so that came to, um, we covered that from the beginning and we, spoke, we wrote about the, the re resolution of that. And in Salvador also, there was a very bloody war in El Salvador and that was, the, the archives of that are now in our newsletters. And there was a regional peace accord called Esquipulas, and and that that was important. Uh, in the notes, and I know we read, we had something on that in the um, in the article that came out. But those are the three important developments that we followed in Central America. I'm going a little fast because we're <laughs> running a little short on time, and uh, you'll be hearing from from Pat on this in a little bit too, but um, it, the 80s, 90s, uh, military leaders were very repressive of uh, leftist opponents, and, and so there was a lot of killing, and, and I think the uh, majority of this happened in Argentina, but it also happened in other countries. Um, um, about six, the, some estimates, these are, these are estimates, yeah. 60,000 deaths occurred because of the dirty war in, in South America. Um, I, these, uh, these, these are, this is some of our coverage, so I don't know if you, can, you can't read it because I tried to put too much in one slide here. But. <laughs> okay, um, Pat, do you want to say the thing about the dirty war in Operation Condor? I think this is one of the darkest periods in Latin American history, but it's also one very much tied to the U.S. as so many things are. It was a U.S.-backed and coordinated campaign of repression and assassination against political opponents 
dur um, among the Southern Cone dictatorships, and, and that included Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Paraguay, and Uruguay. And it began in 1975 in Chile, and it had, again, the backing of the CIA and, um, the, and the U.S. very much so. Some, as Carlos said, some estimates are that 60,000 people died, 30,000 in Argentina alone. And the terror arch archives, this treasure trove of documents that showed up in Paraguay in 1992, um, say that 50,000 people died. The victims included former politicians, um, ac student activists, anybody who opposed the military dictatorships in all of those countries and reached even even to Washington, D.C., where uh, one of the former diplomats from Chile during the Allende years, Orlando Letelier, was a car bomb was planted in his car and he was blown up on Embassy Row in Washington, D.C., along with his, his co-worker, Ronnie Moffat. Um, that was brought, that really brought things to made the U.S. kind of take another look at this backing for this dirty war, but they didn't really stop at that point. The CIA provided planning coordination, training and torture, uh, technical support, and military aid through Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, and Reagan. A lot of that was done at the School of the Americas, and at that time the School of the Americas was in Panama. Um, Henry Kissinger played a very key role in all of this. He backed the dirty wars from the beginning to the end. Um, one of the saddest things, hard to, hard to quantify, sad and sadder in this awful story, pregnant women, young women um, activists who were detained were kept in jail, in prisons, until they gave birth. Then they were killed, and their babies were given to military officers and their wives. A couple of good movies about that. Yeah. The, the mothers, the Madres de, de Plaza de Mayo, spent decades trying to find out what had happened to their children, and in the case of these women, pregnant women, the grandchildren that, that were left behind. Sometimes they were successful in finding out what happened, and other times they weren't. The Dirty Wars, the Operación Condor, ended in 1983 when Argentina returned to civilian rule after they lost the Falklands Malvinas <coughs> War. One of the best resources besides us um, for, the, for the Operation Condor and the Dirty Wars is, the, is an NGO called the National Security Archives, which is housed at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. And during Clinton's administration, he declassified a lot of documents. A lot of them he still didn't declassify, and I think there's some of them, probably not now, but there have been through the years more declassified. I think Obama uh, de declassified a bunch more. But as I said, it's one of the dark periods both for Latin America and for us. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> The founders of the National Security Archive are with in sympathy. Yes. The founders of the, yes. the archives in itself. Um, the other thing that, that we covered broadly was uh, the Advent of Freedom Movements in 1991 in and in the 90s, and uh, there's many other agreements in, in the TPP, Trans Pacific Partnership, that a lot of Latin American countries were involved with. Um, um, the, one of the things that, that occurred during this time was that during the Clinton years, he tried to create a, a hemisphere-wide agreement called the Free Trade Area of the Americas. I took this picture in, in Little Havana. There's a mural, the first, the first <coughs> meeting of the, uh, of the FTAA was in, in, in um, Miami in 2003, I believe, and I happened to be there. Kevin and Pat didn't want to go, so they asked me if I wanted to go. So, <laughs> so I went. It was a great experience. Did you really ask us, Carlos? <laughs> <laughs> and, 
and so I went. It was a, and so I was there in the middle of all the leaders of of uh, um, of um, Latin American countries, with one exception, Fidel Castro was never invited to these things. Mm -hmm. um, so this mural is right there in the middle of our lap. Um, these are some of the agreements that, that came up during this period. Um, Kevin, do you want to say a word about the agreements of in the integration process? So, it's really just a few words. Um, back in the 1990s, when I was working with the LADB from 92 to 98, that's exactly the period that Carlos is talking about when free trade agreements were really just exploding throughout the Americas, but exploding worldwide. And it was a reflection, really, um, the spread of globalization unfolding and exploding as the East and West blocks disintegrated and neoliberalism and structural adjustment, reform and so forth, opening of markets and economies was spreading throughout the Americas, but spreading through ev uh, everywhere. And really what kicked off the trade agreements, I mean there were trade agreements in Central American and South American countries and so forth, either bilateral accords among countries or multilateral accords, but what really kicked off the major regional integration blocks was NAFTA, which was negotiated in 1992, and, or rather uh, approved in 1992, and then took effect in 1993. And then just an explosion of accords, like you see all the names up there, Central American countries, which already had a trade agreement from 30 years before, in a totally different context, began to form a new trade agreement. Central American, uh, uh, excuse me, the Caribbean countries did the same thing, and they began integrating regionally trade wars between the trade, the, the two trade blocks. In South America, you have the Andean <coughs> countries forming an Andean pact, and then Mercosur in the southern cone, and finally culminating, really, not culminating, but uh, blossoming into this free trade area of the Americas. And alongside it, really, what was going on, I mean, the end result and where we're at now today is a very different place what, 30 years later. But um, the what was really behind, in my opinion, and we covered that on a globe-by-globe -globe basis, almost country-by-country, country, was structural adjustment reform going on in Latin America, opening these economies, tearing down the kinds of structures, regulatory structures, protective structures, protective measures, that protected these economies from that kind of inter or disequal uh, trade among themselves and mostly with, with the North, tearing down those kinds of, uh, of, of uh, barriers and opening these economies to an unbelievable influx of foreign investment. And the trade accords were really a reflection of that. It's history where it went to from there, but we covered all of that both by blow during the 1990s. Anyway, that's, that's what the Chronicle of Latin American Affairs really focused on during those years. I just want to take, if I could, two minutes to say a couple things. I really appreciate being invited here. I was at the LIBB for about six years. I've gone on to many other things since then. In Latin America, I lived in Central America for 12 years, and this, when I came in 1992 back from Central America, was an incredible bridge for me to come back to the U.S real way to reintegrate. In 1998, I took a fork in the road. Um, now I am a journalist covering things from the mainstream here in the US and do not have much uh, relation with Latin America, but I can appreciate certain things that I really can't help but say. One is, Nelson, I really, really appreciate that background history from yes. the 1980s. <laughs> you had told me little bits and pieces of it back, when, back in the day, but to hear it and how the origins of the LADB came up is just fascinating. And Rebecca, I remember very well, because we had that uh, place right next to the annex to the, uh, to the institute <laughs> that we were in, and I didn't have an office. You came, down the, you came in the front door and came down the hall, and you had to make a turn, and I turned that little corner thing into an office. That's what that <laughs> That's right. And Sam was out there in the front reception area. I remember it every day, day in and day out, him building that thing over... I don't know how long it was, so I remember all of that. And it was, it's, now at the time, 
you know, my head was so into what we were writing, looking at economic affairs and the other stuff going on as writers and reporters and Latin Americanists, I didn't pay the same attention to technology back then. Now I'm a technology writer. I have been for about 15 years. It's one of the areas I specialize in. And I can truly, that's why I really appreciate the origins and I really appreciate what you were saying, because the technology created the backbone for us as writers and Latin American is to do the things we were doing in a way that we never could before and reach an audience. Today's world, just one second, today's world, what, 30 years later, it's an everyday reality. But back then, LAPB was an, a pioneer mm -hmm. in electronic publishing that allowed us to reach in a specialized area of yeah. coverage, Latin America, a way that we never could have before. It's fascinating now to listen to it. And remember, my mindset back then, I could appreciate it so much more than years later. Dear. I just wanted to say that. I just wanted to add, <clears throat> the people that worked at the LADV were unusual, not only each individual, but it was an, it, we were more than the sum total of our parts. Yes. It was a most extraordinary, dynamic, energy in which, I mean, we haven't touched this yet. The people who wrote on Central America and the people who wrote on South America, those who wrote on South America, edited what the people who were writing on Central America were writing, and vice versa. In other words, so it, and it was not consequently just a matter of style. It's content, it's parallels, it's comparisons, and so forth, all of that, I think it was extraordinary. The weakness, I think, is academia at UNM did not use us to the fullest. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Right. Do I have time to have another comment? Yeah, yeah. no, please, please. Okay. please. I, personally, I mean, I, building on what you're saying, Nelson, as somebody in the mainstream media now, which I was not back then, um, a service like Latin America Database, what it provides, um, clearly it had a broad impact in many, many areas. But in today's world, particularly with the ability we now have to reach our tentacles into so many nooks and crannies everywhere across the board, is that much more, as a journalist, necessary to have this kind of a service? Not just because of the realities that everybody knows in today's world, in Trump's world, and fake news, but that's not what I'm talking about. As a journalist, we cover in the journal border issues, and we're covering very heavily the whole affairs going on now with immigration and the immigration crisis or inventing crisis. But even our reporters, we have a southern New Mexico correspondent who's bicultural, grew up along the border, and she does a very good job as a bicultural reporter who grew up there because she truly understands what she's writing about, writing about the border itself. But to try to explain why we have this massive uh, yeah. emigration of Central Americans. Context, yeah. She doesn't have the context. It's not a criticism of her, it's just a reality. You need people that truly understand those realities from the inside. We sent her down to Guatemala. She did a great job writing on what she, you know, in Guatemala, and then she came back and wrote a whole series of articles about the border. But if you read the article she wrote in Guatemala, what can a person who doesn't have that inside perspective parachute in and try to write really what the bottom line context of what is truly a new upheaval in Central America and a reflection of the aftermath of failed policies for decades? But that person doesn't have that background. And it's these services, but those are the mainstream people that you have writing about these things that are forming your average Joe. Mm -hmm. And it's these services, like LED, that are so important to inform journalists like me, journalists like her, in ways that go far beyond what's available. It's it's critical, these kinds of services. It's a shame to see LED come to an end in that sense, but it served its purpose. It did a lot for the decades it was there, and I'm, I'm happy that I was a part of it for a short time. Now. As, as we mentioned earlier, these articles are going to be available for UNM libraries, and so we're going to try and, and publicize that as much as possible. Um, it, so so that, uh, even though LADB is going away, the work on LADB is going to live 
in perpetuity at the UNM libraries. Um, that was a nice segue to the next um, topic, which is poverty and migration. And again, I'm going to go really quickly because we are running short on time. But um, it, the changing patterns back in when, when I was covering um, immigration and source mix, a lot of times it was the, a lot of the people who were caught and people who were caught crossing the border were um, young men. Um, the, the patterns changed. Um, a, lot, a lot of our coverage in the, in the later years was the unaccompanied man, minors, mm -hmm. and now it's families. And the the, the number of Mexi people from Mexico crossing has has declined, but there's more people from Central America coming. And a lot of times, it's a matter of looking at the the push factors that uh, um, Kevin mentioned the the, the reach that the person who covers the, the <coughs> southern border. Um, but a lot of times, uh, there's not enough. And one of the things that we did with LADB is look a lot at the push factors, and there's even more push factors now. Um, the, um, the, um, for example, climate change. What is climate change doing to the ability of people in Central America to, to grow crops? Um, the structural adjustments, the, the changes in, in, in eliminating, um, this happened with NAFTA a little bit, the eliminating the the supports, the price supports, um, the agriculture uh, came down. Uh, did you have a yeah, I just want to say something about this because I've been thinking about it a lot, and this is what I wrote my master's thesis about. Because I think that some, there, it's true that the, the who's getting to the border is changing now, but I think some of the reasons that it's changing don't really have only to. I, what happened back in the day in the 80s when the, the wars were happening in Central America, women and children were displaced, but they could not get out of the country. It's all about um, access to, it's also, you need, it takes more to get all the way here. And some of the factors in what it takes to get here have changed in the 30 years. So it's not that women and children weren't um, refugees back 30 years ago, they were refugees that were internally displaced, or they were refugees who could get to a refugee camp, maybe the Salvadorans in Honduras. It, it was harder, they had fewer networks to get all the way to the border. But I don't think it's just that it's new refugees, I just think that we are experiencing it in a new way. Yeah. But so I, I just feel like yeah, that's important to understand because. Yeah. A lot of things are happening worldwide with migration and who can and how far migrants can get, and that has a lot to do with technology and also with the pathways that people have for um, just getting indebted to get to the journey. So I just like to throw that. Yeah, that's very important. I, I just think that's you know, it's in our writing reflected that sort of analysis that that a lot of a lot of the way that we wrote our articles. Um, there was there was attempts of immigration reform that we covered, and um, um, that we could talk more. We could talk for days about um, U.S. immigration policy in Mexico and Central America. But I do, just wanted to bring up others. That Costa Rica has had some some um, issues with Nicaraguan migrants, and and uh, Argentina, of course, has had uh, Argentina being a these are countries that are wealthier, and some of the people from other countries, Argentina, are especially on, especially now with President Macri, uh, there's been a lot of a lot of repression. But there's a lot of uh, some some areas of Argentina, immigrants from Bolivia are are being persecuted, and so these are things that are happening in Central America and South America, and we we covered these things also, as well as the U.S. immigration issues. And again, the irony back on the during the um, wars, the, the guerrilla wars in Colombia, a lot, of, a lot of Colombian refugees are ending up in Venezuela, and now with the economic situation in Venezuela, a lot of Venezuelans are ending up in Colombia. So I just wanted to, to, to mention that in passing also. Another thing that was important that we covered was uh, the, the drug policy and, and the U.S. Had a, US, U.S. had a policy of certifying countries as allies in the fight against drug, um, uh, to, uh, in the fight to control drugs, and so um, 
The certification um, offended a lot of Latin American countries. Um, and and um, so the, the thing about that is, is that um, the Latin American countries said if there wasn't as much demand in the United States, it wouldn't be a drug problem. And that was a decision of Latin American countries. And we covered all of that drug certification. Other changes, uh, uh, for Mexico, one of the things that changed in this relationship with the United States is when the Supreme Court uh, passed a, a bill to allow extradition of its citizens and sold a lot of the drug. Um, El Chapo, of course, was the latest one sent to the United States, but Ocial Carmen Guillén of the Gulf Cartel ended up in, the, the Ariano Felix brothers from the Tijuana Cartel ended up in U.S. prisons. Um, the, uh, the drug cartels became more violent. The Zetas were um, army deserters who were enforcers for the uh, uh, Gulf Cartel, but they eventually formed their own cartel and they started, they started actually killing civilians. A lot of times civilians got caught in crossfire, but then they actually started extorting and killing civilians. Um, and then one thing that really ramped it up in Mexico was, was Felipe Calderón who launched a war on, um, um, on drugs, really put the military in charge of, of drug enforcement, and that really ramped it up the violence in Mexico. Um, two things that happened in uh, Mexico is, is decriminalize the possession of small amounts of, of narcotics, and Uruguay went a, a step further and, and, and legalized drugs in general. Um, so, uh, Again, I apologize for going fast. Okay. Um, the final issue that we wanted to talk to about is environment and climate change. Um, and these are conflicts, tensions, development and environment, conflict with indigenous communities with deforestation and logging. There's fires in the Amazon um, that are, the Amazon is all basically uh, a barometer of, of what's happening. Um, um, melting glaciers, this is in Venezuela. What we talked about, we covered how glaciers are melting in, in, in Chile and in Bolivia. And that's an impact of climate change. And so... Um, the butterflies. I, I apologize, yeah. The well, butterflies. Rebecca asked me to talk about the, and I didn't do it, put in my PowerPoint that we covered uh, in, in the but there was letter. The, the lesson plan. The modern butterflies. Yeah. The modern butterflies. Which has finally hit mainstream press, <coughs> but you were writing about it when I started I in 96. <laughs> so, I, again, I apologize for the quick nature, but we run, we were running late, and again, thank you all. Nelson, do you have a... It's um, something that I hope that perhaps in the future we could meet again and discuss, and that is to what extent or degree did we succeed or fail in integrating this work with teaching, mm -hmm. the university. We were located in a university. Was the university involved with us? I don't know, but I learned a huge amount working here. True. Um, reading it every day and it's you know I've totally changed careers but when I read the news I remember you know months years thousands of you know articles that you guys wrote with context and it would have been amazing to have used it you know if I had that when I was studying political sciences and undergraduate I would have been a, a fuller and more developed person when I worked on NAFTA in DC before I came here <laughs> we had some support from some faculty yeah. Individuals, but for the, for the most, just yeah, yeah, Bill and of course the Dr. Di Gregorio and others really, really, really valued stuff. us. But, yeah. but, but really, I, I think there was that your, your point is that that it's just correct that we were missing the, the um, holistic interaction with with the academia and the university. So again, thank you all for being here. Yeah. So before we uh, we'll get before we adjourn for refreshments, I just want to say, you know, Carlos's announcement with, with the wrap up of LADV, he's he's planning to retire, and and so uh, we have a card for you from all your coworkers, and there's a little gifty in there for your one of your hobbies, and then and then there's a I remember the plaque. Oh, oh yeah.
five years, years of, of, of steady, uh, careful, thoughtful work uh, at, at LEDB. I think the, the quality of, of the writing and, and the accumulated body of, of, of knowledge that's represented by the database is, is really a testament to your, to your focus and attention and, 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 and expertise. So I really appreciate all, all the work you. that you've done over here. We almost lost our articles in 2010. We had Rebecca talked about the old building yeah. and, and how how it got really hot and our server failed. Um, our IT person at that time had to scramble to to just get the articles and just dump them back into the system. So we have the articles and many articles are in one big block of text. Yeah. And so. One of the things I'm still doing is reformatting those articles so we can put them in the yeah, library. Basically, break them back yeah. apart. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. Putting, finding the subheads and putting the paragraphs. But we almost, we almost lost this, and so we, we are appreciative to have been saved, saved those articles yeah. for posterity. Yeah. I remember giving given like I felt like you know the president with a special key or something. I was given the way to restart the sewer server, but never do it. You know, don't touch it unless that was the scariest thing. I had to do it twice because of the air conditioning and something overheating. And by the way, the building is centrally air conditioned now, so we can oh, wow. the, <laughs> the server the server is housing the main IT building also now. So so those two things. When it, even though LEDB doesn't exist anymore, it's the those two things. If, if, if yeah. we ever come back, those uh, uh, those two yeah. factors are in place. Yeah. <laughs> Thank right. you, Bill. Thank you so much, fellas.